because uh, it has global implications. So let me just briefly uh, address uh, how we, pe we perceive what's going on uh, in Ukraine and uh, the implications to our region. You know, no doubt uh, this is a seismic event in international sort of uh, relations history. What we're seeing is not just a crisis or a conflict, it's a war and it's an invasion. You know, Japan is known to be a very sort of, you know, careful country. Uh, we, we don't sort of play around with this aggressive word, but this time around, there were no hesitation in Japan to define what's happening in Ukraine as an invasion. Right? Uh, in, the, uh, in the past, Japan sometimes pursued a, you know, a different kind of uh, Russia policy because we have northern sort of territory issues with Russia. But, uh, you know, as I said, this time around, uh, we had no hesitation in defining what, what's going on uh, in Ukraine. So the Ukraine-Russia war will not, you know, si significantly change, you know, the global geopolitical reality, I guess, but it will change geopolitical perceptions in a major way. You know, Putin's Russia will loom large as a short-term threat, but uh, China will remain a medium to long-term threat. So how to balance the short-term threats with this uh, medium, long -term, uh, medium to long-term threats will be, I guess, critically important. Although, you know, we tend to, to, to be drawn to the, you know, the, the former, the short-term threat, we must also maintain focus on the latter as well. I guess maybe it's too early to sort of speculate, but in case of Russia, we can expect major changes post Putin, right? That is if Putin does not take the world to hell before his demise. But in case of China, I think the threat, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the threat is structural and we cannot expect major changes uh, post Xi. That is, I think, because the overwhelming reality is that China is narrowing the, narrowing the power gap with the United States. You know, despite this, you know, American consciousness, if you will, will have to be drawn toward the, the European front. This is because, you know, in the face of Russia's uh, 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 you know, uh, recent outburst of establishing a sphere of influence through the use of force, the US has no choice but to confront it with power and uh, even Europe, which has been sort of, you know, noticeably distancing itself from the United States, trying to sort of establish its uh, in independent sort of Euro European security policy, is returning to the recognition that American power is indispensable in countering sort of Russia's aggression. I guess you know, German, you know, Germany's review of its defense posture is based on this premise. And, you know, China will try to behave as a responsible sort of country while closing up to Russia. I think China is probably, you know, just learning how dangerous a game it is to attempt to change the status quo uh, by force after seeing the unity of the West and other countries in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It will, I think become increasingly difficult for China to justify, you know, an, sort of an excellent Sino-Russian uh, relations as the two leaders did in Beijing just this February. So China may begin to assert that, you know, it is not an outlaw state like Russia, you know, though, uh, although its domestic system differs from that of the West. And it may double down on establishing a sphere of influence through coercive uh, but non-lethal measures, which, you know, in a way they're already doing. In the United States, it appears as, as if the battle of lines between, you know, the strategic competition school and the tough engagement school has been settled with the uh, sort of the victory of the former. But there may be a pushback by the latter based on, you know, this, this argument of China acting sort of responsibly. The good news is that 
you know, the, the right-wing populism is not on a uh, upsurge in Western sort of democracies, though, you know, anxiety about 2024 in the U.S. looms in the background. Right-wing populism may end up accepting Putin's logic of sort of right-wing value relativism, i.e., you know, after all, it's, it's, it's all about power. If this spreads to Asia, I think it could lead to a sort of a tacit acceptance of China's power-based policies and acceptance of a new model of great power relations, which is de facto accepting China's sphere of influence. It is not impossible that large number of refugee, refugees from Ukraine could trigger the rise of right-wing populism, but fortunately, uh, we're not seeing a sign of this uh, today. And neither in terms of capability nor in terms of its intentions, the U.S. does not have the capacity for a long-term sustained commitment to the two spheres, which is the Indo-Pacific and the European front. But I think the geopolitical reality demands that the U.S. commit to both. And if this is the case, the U.S. partners on the European and in the Pacific fronts will have no choice but to commit themselves more actively. The good news is that you know, it is already happening, as we see in Germany, and on on our side, as we're seeing in the case of you know uh, uh, arrangement like AUKUS and Japan's uh, changing of of behavior in terms of you know accepting more uh, affirmative role in security matters. So. It is already happening. The, the message uh, is certainly coming through that U.S. will stand by Ukraine, but will not intervene directly, although you know, it might change after the sort of the horrible images that, that, uh, that is, is coming out from Ukraine. But as of now, uh, U.S. has clearly sort of drawn a line between NATO and non-NATO members. While you know, this logic cannot be applied directly to, to Asia, you know, many, because many countries uh, in, in our region, including Taiwan, fall within this line. Because uh, even countries, uh, not countries, but even uh, uh, Taiwan is uh, uh, de facto defined as a non-NATO major ally. Right? So in this regard, the situation in Ukraine is not considered to be directly applicable to Asia. However, there's uh, no doubt that uh, uh, how uh, you know, U.S. acts would uh, uh, dramatically sort of uh, define America's credibility uh, it, you know, in this region and beyond. So that's my brief uh, sort of uh, 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 you know, uh, view of uh, how we see you know, what's going on in Ukraine. And now sort of I'd like to turn about the, uh, you know, uh, the concept of, of Indo-Pacific and how it is uh, relevant to us and hopefully to you as well. Right. So let me explain, uh, uh, sort of first explain about the kind of situation that, that we're facing. We're clearly facing, uh, uh, you know, the rise of China, uh, which is uh, unpredictable in nature, and also threats posed by North Korea. The former is a long-term uh, sort of issue and the latter is a short-term, a short-term issue. Although you know it's 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 very dangerous, very dangerous to predict, you know, anything about uh, North Korea because we've been talking about North Korea being a short-term threat since the mid '90s, right? So it's been going on for more than close to uh, uh, 30 years. Uh, this the the North Korea has been constantly sort of shooting uh, missiles uh, uh, sort of around us and over us from a short term to mid range to uh, sort of intercontinental uh, no, sort of ballistic missiles to even sort of hypersonics uh, these days. Uh, you know, it covers all of Japan and it comes, it has it, it also become, uh, almost become routine. I, I, I don't exactly remember how many shots uh, North Korea has shot in 2022, but uh, it clearly is a threat. And this has been going on for more than 20 years. And uh, the fact that we're faced with a one of the most unpredictable nation is, is very worrisome. Japan is trying to counter uh, this threat with the, uh, the missile defense system. 
but you know uh, the missile sort of de defense system is not totally reliable so uh, there has been a discussion about japan acquiring a capability of its own to sort of uh, attack preemptively uh, when we know for sure that North Korea is preparing to shoot a missile. Right. Uh, one sort of unfortunate uh, development uh, on the Korean Peninsula for the, for, the, for the past decade or so is the uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, the difficult relations we have with uh, South Korea. Uh, you know, I'm not going to sort of go, go into this uh, because it's a very uh, sensitive and a complicated issue. But, uh, 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 you know, they have their own arguments. We have our own. But just recently, there was an election, uh, a national election in South Korea. And uh, a, a, a moderately conservative, a pro-American, and hopefully pro-Japanese uh, 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 president was re-elected. So uh, hopefully, the relations between Japan uh, and uh, South Korea, and including the United States, would uh, sort of, you know, turn out to be better and, and, and uh, if we can manage uh, you know, issues on Korean Peninsula together, uh, we can come out hopefully with an effective solution. Uh, so the issue of, of China, this is the, the biggest issue that, that we're facing, but we're not uh, you know, against China's rise per se. Uh, you know, Japan is not, you know, is not like an anti-China country because uh, Back in the days when, when, when I was young, back in the, that's a long time ago, but uh, back in the days uh, when I was young, we always sort of, you know, uh, talked about Japan-China relations in terms of friendship, right? But things started to change uh, maybe in the early 2000s. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that was because, you know, China's rise and its perception of regional order was uh, getting worse. Uh, if you add up what China's doing in the region, uh, there are some worrying trends. Right? Uh, that we see a potential sort of, uh, you know, China-centric order that they're trying to sort of establish. And there's a danger of it being a hegemonic order. And for instance, the recent sort of, you know, uh, relations with Russia sort of indicates China is going sort of into that direction. Uh, there's some worrying trend domestically, although there's a limit to what we can do. There's uh, uh, issues uh, sort of uh, uh, related to sort of uh, you know, uh, Xinjiang, uh, uh, the region, you know, what's happening in Hong Kong, Tibet. And their sort of, you know, uh, uh, attitude of sort of you know, aggressive attitude to toward Taiwan is also very worrisome as well. So many countries in the region are not comfortable with this uh, coercive attitude of China. But many countries cannot contest to sort of uh, China's actions directly. Uh, you know, for instance, you know, our friends in Southeast Asia, they always talk about geography being a fate, that China is always up there. And while, you know, US uh, and, and Japan remains a very important part of, you know, Southeast Asia, for instance, US can always decide to leave, right? But China is always up there. So our friends in Southeast Asia would say, don't force us to choose. We, we want to sort of maintain an equal distance to, uh, uh, you know, both sides. Not that they're comfortable with China. They're worried about Chinese sort of coercive attitudes. But since U.S. might decide to leave or can decide to leave, and China is always right up there, you know, they're nervous about choosing sides. Even a middle power like Korea has that kind of tendency. But you know, Japan is different in that context. Right? I think we have clearly stated that we do not want to live in a China-centric sphere or sort of hegemonic order, which is centered around China. Again, it's not that you know, we're anti-China or anything, but we prefer a liberal, open, and international order. We think that's good for Japan. We think that's good for the region. And we think that's even good for China as well. 
So this notion of free and open in the Pacific, that uh, Japan is uh, uh, you know, at, sort of at the center of it, is a concept that has sort of conceptualized this notion, right? That we do not prefer a China-centric sort of order. We prefer a liberal, open, and rule-based international order. And it's, a, it's something that we would like to defend and something that we would prefer. It's not a concept to deny sort of, sort of you know, or China's rise or China's ambitions. So recently, the Biden administration sort of also came out with this uh, document uh, about Indo-Pacific strategy, right? You know, after reading it initially, you know, there wasn't mention about China all of that much. It was more about you know, what kind of sort of region that we would like to have, what kind of sort of aspirations are sort of ingrained into this the concept of Indo-Pacific. So it was a positive sort of concept rather than sort of denying something, you know, uh, something sort of posed by China. So I, I saw a resonance there. And the, the reason why we have designed it so is because, you know, we don't have to convince, you know, our partners like Australia or, or US about the dangers of China's sort of, you know, uh, uh, a sort of hegemonic order. It's more about convincing our friends in Southeast Asia that the kind of all that, that that we're trying to uphold is better for you and it is better for us and better for the region as well. So, you know, anyhow, uh, the, the free and open Pacific is a concept that sort of is trying to describe the desirable uh, 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 sort of uh, you know, an order that is preferred in the region. So the question is, can Japan defend this liberal international order alone? Can we counter this uh, hegemonic or potentially hegemonic China's aggression uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, with, with you know, Japan's ability alone? The clear answer is that we, we, we do not have the, the capability to do so. Right? I think the power gap between uh, Japan and China is increasing and it will increase. So we look around uh, you know, searching for the best partner to sort of uh, act together to defend this uh, uh, free and open Pacific, who we can trust, who we share values, and who would take action. Right? And, you know, there, there, there are many, many part potential partners. You know, Australia is one. Hopefully, we can develop a, 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 a relation with Korea that resonates with this concept. But the most reliable partner that we have is clearly uh, the United States because of the, the alliance arrangement that we have with the US. It's not that we totally rely, we totally trust you know, everything US does. Right? We had our own difficulties during the Trump era with his notion of uh, America first, sometimes uh, you know, uh, sort of approaching uh, Japan with a sort of transactionary sort of uh, attitude. Uh, but, you know, since you know, our former prime minister, Abe, had a good personal sort of chemistry with Mr. Trump, we somehow sort of managed through. But, but, but you know, it was a difficult year for us. But it, it's not that we sort of, you know, uh, accepted sort of America's, uh, uh, you know, ideas about the world or America first uh, sort of without any hesitation. I think it's important to remind you that despite the fact that we sort of, you know, uh, try to sort of somehow manage the relation with uh, uh, Trump, uh, we kept our belief about, you know, free trade. We, we, we were sort of uh, defending uh, the importance of, you know, trans-Pacific partnership. Uh, we were also interested in sort of, you know, uh, proceeding with the uh, trade uh, sort of negotiations with, the U with, uh, with, with Europe. You know, global warming was an important issue. So, you know, the fact is that we did maintain, uh, 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 you know, uh, sort of the basic stance of Japanese foreign policy, despite us sort of, you know, managing, uh, uh, you know, uh, the relations with the United States under Trump. And also, I think it's important to remind you that, you know, Prime Minister Abe was one of the few prime ministers who managed, uh, you know, sort of, uh, uh, we ha who had a good relations with both Obama 
and Mr. Trump. And, and you don't see that much of that. And that is because there are sort of US-Japan relations is an institutionally established relations. So I think in the background, uh, uh, you know, China's sort of uh, rise and, you know, our perception about uh, China is in the background. So I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll try to finish. Uh, I think, you know, sort of returning to uh, the issue of U Ukraine, I think uh, Ukraine would have a, a, a sort of a many sort of effect, uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, not only in your region, but in our region as well. And, uh, you know, Japan relies on a stable, stable sort of liberal international order. And, you know, uh, the, you know, uh, a tendency where raw power defines sort of international sort of uh, order and international relations is not acceptable. And we on our side is, uh, uh, has shown our determinations that uh, uh, we would sort of, you know, defend this liberal international order and in that sense, uh, you know, we have to sort of uh, uh, tell uh, sort of Russia and Putin that it, the thing that they're doing right now is not acceptable. And I think we have to sort of stick together and push back the trend that we're seeing right now. So I'll, I'll end my talk here. Thank you very much. Professor Nakayama, thank you so much for this fascinating presentation. I have already so many questions. I, I, ha I hope we'll have an opportunity to discuss some of them at least. Uh, thank you. And with this, uh, let me give floor to Professor Hirose, please. Thank you so much uh, for a kind in, uh, introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Yoko Hirose, a professor at Keio University. It is great honor for me to attend such wonderful symposium today. Thank you very much for a kind invitation. Uh, for many years, I have been engaging the research of the international relations of former USSR, focusing on, on the Caucasus region. And as you know, now Russia is invading and attacking Ukraine. Uh, this has a major impact on the world and will also uh, make a major change to our paradigms of regional politics and international relations. Now, for example, I couldn't believe that Russia attacked our grain uh, because um, I thought uh, the best uh, way for uh, Russia to um, to have to keep the Ukraine under their uh, power uh, is that uh, they should keep the uh, Lugansk and Donetsk uh, as the undergunite states. Uh, so there are so many uh, questioning uh, things in this uh, world. So and under such situations, I'd like to consider what a Japanese HOIP uh, can do and how Japan and Georgia relations uh, should be advanced in the future. A Japanese HOIP, uh, free and open in the Pacific, is the main pillar of Japanese diplomacy today. HOIP as an initiative to develop the free and open in the Pacific region as an international commons by ensuring a rule-based international order and a comprehensive and transparent manner with an emphasis on the centrality and unity of ASEAN in order to guarantee the peace and prosperity of the in the Pacific region as a whole and uh, bring stability and prosperity to any countries. The following items are listed as the three pillars for realizing COIP. The first, uh, dissemination and consolidation of the rule of law, a freedom of navigation, free trade, and so forth. As the second, the pursuit of economic prosperity. It aims to strengthen connectivity and economic partnership, including EPA, FTE, and investment agreement. As a third, uh, securing peace and st stability. This includes a building a maritime law and enforcement ca cap capacity and providing humanitarian assistance and uh, disaster relief. Hope's diplomatic policy 
was formed in August uh, 2016, but uh, the spirit of Hoip has long been the foundation of Japanese diplomacy. In other words, the spirit has always arrived in Japan and Georgia relations as well. Japan has been supporting Georgia's rule and law and variety of liberalization. Through ODA and other means, Japan has also worked to strengthen connectivity through the development of Jap Georgia's infra infra infrastructures and through a variety of economic partnerships. And Japan has also been involved in individual Georgian companies and individual projects in a variety of ways to help Georgia's economy develop in a, a multi-faced manner. Japan has also worked to ensure uh, peace and stability in Georgia. As uh, exemplified by humanitarian assistance for internet, internally displaced uh, persons from Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and other countries. And Japan and Georgia have common problems. That is first that uh, Russia is occupying our important territories. Japan has long been deprived, de deprived of northern territories by Russia after the end of World War II. And uh, Georgia has been deprived of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. In addition, the two regions have effectively become of, uh, part of Russia, actually. What can be said in common is the first fact that uh, Russia made a changing the status quo uh, by force. And it means that the violations of the sovereignty and the territorial integrity principle of Japan and Georgia were committed. In addition, Russia is currently changing the status quo of Ukraine by force. As its diplomatic strategy, Russia has formally uh, firmly uh, maintains its uh, sphere of interest, in, uh, sphere of interest or influence. For Russia in particular, it is extremely important to continue to secure the countries of the former USSR as sphere of in influence or interest. That being said, uh, there is no just justification for Russia's attempt to prevent Georgia or Ukraine from joining NATO or the European Union. Moreover, I do not believe that the war in Ukraine is even based on the concept of sphere of inter influence or interest. In other words, I think we can say that uh, it is not a Russian war, uh, but a war of President Putin uh, based on the delusion of suffering and his pride. The international community should not forgive this unjustified war and we must not include any further the ever pre precedent of changing the status quo by force by Russia. If such bad uh, precedent uh, is uh, against it, the change of the status quo by force by a despotic state, state other than uh, Russia, such as uh, China, will become a uh, rampant in the international community. Uh, we, uh, the liberal nations, uh, cannot uh, confront uh, the change of status quo by force. Unfortunately, uh, we can only promote the political solution while impose economic sanction and so on. However, the recent economic sanction against Russia has become extremely harsh based on international cooperation. It is wonderful for international community to work together for freedom and democracy. And I believe that uh, this solidarity can prevail over the uh, primitive prim prim nations. Japan and Georgia should read this international solidarity. And in this trend, we, we sincerely hope that our territorial issue will also be resolved and that we will be able to recapture the territory we had lost. 
Georgia is an important Eurasian hub country with rare and wonderful history and culture. In Japan, the Georgian Film Festival was being held from January to February, and all movies were truly wonderful and highly regarded. In addition, uh, the Georgian movie, The Golden Thread, is still show showing with great success. And I will also uh, be talking about it at the movie at the theater event in April. In addition, Georgian cuisine is also very popular in Japan. In this way, Japan has an extremely strong sense of affinity towards Georgia. I believe that uh, Japan should continue to do what uh, can be in multifarious uh, manner for the development of Georgia. And I'd like to conclude uh, my talk by envisioning positive future in which both countries will contribute to peace and development of the region by deepening the partnership between the two countries. So thank you so much for attention. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Hirose. And uh, uh, this time I would like to give floor to David, uh, Dr. David uh, Goginashvili. Uh, Dr. Goginashvili, the floor is yours. Today it's a great honor to be part of this conference. <coughs> with my, my presentation. Um, because when I was uh, asked to talk about Japan's foreign policy convergence in Georgia, to be honest, I was slightly puzzled uh, whether to, or real convergence. I'm not. I'm still not sure. Uh, definitely, there is no this divergence or this convergence. Uh, however, there are some challenges, uh, and I will talk about this later. But uh, before that, let me briefly talk about um, the historical background of uh, Japan's involvement in, in Georgia and Japan's foreign policy, which actually not many people know, but dates back as far as 19th century. And uh, there was uh, amazing episodes of uh, historical uh, cooperation between Japan and Georgia and between, I would say, Japanese um, intelligence and Georgian and against uh, Tsarist Russia and so on and so forth. But I will not stop, uh, talk about that uh, today. I will skip that part and uh, mostly focus on what happened after the Cold War um, and um, that Japan faced a new challenge uh, how to deal with the newly independent countries and um, what Japan did is what it what it was uh, good at to provide ODA official development assistance. Um, that was timing was especially very good. In 1992, Japan established its first uh, official development assistance charter. And uh, from 1994, we enjoyed uh, Japanese aid a lot, mostly. Um, it was uh, technical assistance or grassroots activities. But uh, in the end of 90s, Moto um, declared Eurasian, Eurasian diplomacy, which uh, brought a lot of hopes in our region, uh, and um, namely Baku, Azerbaijan became the first host of the Japanese embassy. It was, I think, uh, end of 90s, and uh, in 1998, we had our uh, Japanese first Prime Minister to visit the region. It was also in, in Azerbaijan, not in Georgia. And, but uh, the embassy brought new possibilities and uh, 
then we enjoyed long-term young loans for the construction of uh, different uh, like infrastructure and so on. In 2006, namely, um, uh, Japanese foreign minister, then foreign minister Taro Aso, declared uh, the policy of arc of freedom and prosperity. And that was something new because that was something new for Japan as well, because uh, unlike its previous focus was on which Japan could share basic values of freedom and democracy and uh, from the point of view of uh, geopolitics, the arc would encircle Russia and China. And especially in these uh, independent countries and the ones who were pro-Western like Ukraine and Georgia, there were a lot of hopes. And then in 2006, the uh, Daruaso uh, declared the arc of freedom and prosperity and the next year, Georgia seeking for some closer ties because there was a Georgia and Ukraine as well that now we will have a new player in the region, new strong player in the region. And that time it was a second economy in the world. Uh, it did not work exactly as, as Georgians probably portrayed for themselves, but uh, it brought a lot of uh, investments, aid again, of course, a lot of cultural exchange, a technical assistance. Uh, a lot of uh, Georgians went through trainings in, in Japan, uh, students exchanged like myself, and so on. 2018, years of our independence, we got our first uh, minister level visit from Japan. Georgia, and it was a big deal. And they declared uh, Japan Caucasus Initiative. initiative a, a lot of projects were uh, were initiated uh, not all, all of them went well there were like some problems especially with ODA and the long long term uh, yen loans and so on but still the initiative at that time uh, but it lacked uh, consistency I would say about, especially when we talk about convergence, uh, we should not uh, forget about multilateral formats. Partnership or Japan-Guam cooperation program. Um, another upcoming multilateral uh, format or framework, I would say, is free and open uh, Indo-Pacific, COIP, what Professor Hirose just talked about a lot. There is a lot that we could cooperate about within this format, and and one more uh, format which I uh, really anticipate to be lucrative for for both sides is EU partnership on connectivity and quality infrastructure. European Union still, uh, as we already see, Georgia can be. Uh, beneficiary of this partnership a lot, especially in, in the connectivity part and the infrastructural part and, and, and the issues co connecting to, uh, to exchange of information.
convergence. I still doubt that what we are witnessing between Japan and Georgia can be called Yes, we do share basic values. Support each other on international arena, uh, co-sponsor uh, each other's uh, resolutions on, on, on the uh, in the United Nations or other international organizations. Uh, they support each other's candidates, which is uh, very important. Infrastructural or cultural matters is exceptional and uh, economic diplomacy as well, because uh, in, in recent period, we signed two uh, very important uh, treaties, uh, BAT, uh, Bilateral Investment Treaty, and the Treaty on, on um, Double Taxation, which was a big deal. Uh, however, there I would call that there are still challenges for convergence, for, for what I would call pure convergence between two countries' foreign policies. And uh, I would call this, the problem is that there is no problem. Because there is not enough interaction between two countries interruption than when there is enough exchange. But there is no problem now. And for instance, when Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, then Minister of Foreign Affairs Motegi was um, presenting uh, at the Japanese Diet about the treaty, uh, how double taxation is important. He talked about how great, and we all were happy about it. It's, it's amazing, yes. Aspect of uh, bilateral relations is really exceptional. But uh, with the goals of Georgian's diplomacy really is, and uh, it is not limited to culture or, or, or products like wine. We establish ourselves uh, as a sovereign and a free independent country in this very chaotic international order when, where we need uh, support from the one. But uh, the problem here is that Japan itself does not really grasp how powerful the Japanese either diplomats or A small country, which I would not agree with. Capacity to stronger leadership on international arena, but for this, I think Japanese. Did specify whether it's diplomacy or government or, or a nation, but Japanese side, I would say, should realize how uh, powerful they can be and how powerful actor they can become on international arena. The, uh, Japan does not have the will, will uh, to become a powerful actor. Japan has the capacity if we measure it uh, in pure uh, the, the numbers, not the political will. Japan is, as the world is facing some turning point, Japan has a chance to 
develop a stronger stance on uh, in, in international uh, society. I was surprised, to be honest, how Japan reacted, especially how, after uh, Japanese Russia was playing hard, but just like in Georgia, Japan always kept low profile. Yes, it was supportive, but until the extent where it would not cross the red lines against Russia, the reaction was swift, was surprising for me. Um, there was a statement from <clears throat> the head of the European Department of Minister of Foreign Affairs, Hideki Uyama, and then Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, and of course the Minister uh, Yoshimasa Hayashi. They all stated that the Northern Territories are illegally occupied by Russia. And there is nothing new, but we should not forget that within the last years, Japanese government was refraining for, from, from uh, this polatant or clear statements. The statement would go, let me translate it correctly. Japan has sovereignty. Or something that Russia would painfully react to. Stronger leader and and uh, make FOIP more FOIP strategy more feasible on the world scale is to save on, on such things as, such as, for example, uh, non recognition of uh, the illegally occupied Abkhazia and South Ossetia. One might ask me, but. Um, Definitely, Japan can and has the power to pressure, or not even pressure, but government of Nauru. To, uh, you know, make Nauru in South Ossetia. Japan has the power, Japan has the pipes. Uh, with the government of Nauru, and uh, Japan goes this way, then it becomes much more trustworthy partner for Georgians. And it will be much greater uh, present for Georgians than all these infrastructural uh, aids and assistances or the uh, long-term yen loans. We are at the turning point where Japan, as, as well, will will realize uh, that uh, uh, rule-based international order, which is the as, as Nakayama, Professor Nakayama said, the goal of FOIP strategy uh, requires uh, steps towards such sensitive matters. Uh, from which Japan has been uh, kind of avoiding itself or reluctant to get involved. In the end, I think I, in the end, I would just uh, would like to say that uh, and there is a cooperation either on the level of uh, uh, economy or or geopolitics and then culture as well. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Goginashvili, thank you very much and our apologies to you and especially to our audience for the technical difficulties that were obviously beyond our control.
If I may now open the floor for the questions, and I will take my position uh, um, to, to ask uh, the first question to Professor Nakayama. Uh, you are the expert on American foreign policy. Uh, and uh, I'm tempted to give you just the whole score of questions, but if we could just focus on a couple of issues. First of all, um, how do you uh, see the U.S. foreign policy in, this pro in the unfolding crisis uh, caused by Russian invasion in Ukraine, Russia's attempt to break down the uh, rules-based international system, which does not necessarily take away the challenge that China has been posing to the U.S. and to the system that we are uh, so concerned about, only the difference is that Russia is doing it by upturning the table, by throwing things in the air, uh, and China has been doing it much more methodically, quietly, with a strategy, uh, this is the question number one. Number two, you just mentioned how Chinese attitude toward Japan changed when China um, this coincided, uh, I guess, uh, at the time with the time when China overtook Japan as number two economy. With that in view, how do you foresee? How do you? Uh, uh, w how would you assess China-Russian relations if we consider that at the time when? These were two communist allies before the things were, went sour in the 60s. Uh, so the Soviet GDP was twice as that of China. Today, Chinese GDP is 10 times bigger. So uh, it's very hard to escape the uh, prospect of if a real alliance is formed, which I'm not very much con convinced between the two. It's quite clear who the big brother is going to be. Thank you. Yes, and, and uh, Dr. Netrevelli would like to add another question. <laughs> it's my question. Thank you, first of all, to all speakers for very interesting presentations. And Professor Nakayama, as Georgi already has um, addressed the questions to you, let me also follow up, because my question is also linked with the China and the U.S. We have just heard lately that uh, Russia has asked uh, for economic and military support to China. Um, uh, against, you know, to be used against the Ukraine. And um, today uh, in Rome, we, Jack Sullivan will be made a meeting with his counterpart. So how would all that play out in your vision? And in case China agrees, then what does that mean? Thank you. Well, thank you for that really uh, difficult but uh, important questions. Now, I don't have a clear cut uh, answer, you know, uh, but regarding the first point about sort of where America stands, I think America is confused uh, as well uh, because their in Biden administration's intentions was to focus on China, that their understanding that the main sort of uh, adversary in terms of strategic competition was China. And Biden, when he met uh, uh, Putin back in June in Geneva, I think he clearly told uh, uh, Mr. Xi that you know, uh, our focus would be on China, so don't just mess around. You know? Our intention is to stabilize. You know, we can't be, we we may not become partners, but you know, we, we want to sort of stabilize, freeze the 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 uh, the, the Russia-U.S. relations. I think that was the kind of message that uh, President Biden told. Uh, Mr. Putin. And I think the message that Mr. Putin received was slightly different because, you know, uh, if, if you add up what uh, uh, sort of uh, the U.S. retreat from Afghanistan in August, uh, the Biden administration's notion of middle class foreign policy, if you add that up, there won't be a sort of hard response from the United States, despite the fact that Russia takes you know, uh, an aggressive attitude. So I think the Biden team has sent a wrong message, but was there sort of an alternative way of handling the issue? You know, it's, it's difficult because if you look at the reality of what's, you know, the, the American people's attitude toward, you know, these uh, security issues, 
after sort of you know spending their time 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan, the American people are tired. Right? They're not interested in engaging or taking responsibilities. So they had to sort of uh, you know uh, focus on China. So in a way, you know, I, I don't want to sound fatalistic, but in a way, it was uh, unavoidable if Mr. Putin was determined to do so. I think American attitude in, in, in sort of, you know, uh, uh, sort of, you know, sharing intelligence, uh, trying to sort of reveal Russia's intentions, also at the same time uh, taking, you know, aggressive uh, diplomatic actions to somehow tame the situation. I think they tried their best. The, so the question now is what they are determined to do now, right? But the the, the constant message that we've been, you know, we're hearing from Washington and the capitals from Europe is that we would draw a clear line between NATO and non-NATO uh, 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 members. So when I heard that message, this notion of you know, a responsibility to protect duty beyond borders, you know, which is very prevalent back in the 1990s and early 2000s, is uh, almost gone, right? That, you know, drive towards, you know, uh, th that we have to do something in order to uh, uh, protect humanitarian disasters is gone. So in an unfortunate way, we're returning to a uh, uh, sort of international relations uh, based on sort of uh, you know power realism and all that, so that's the the trend that I'm seeing in uh, 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 Ukraine vis-a-vis uh, -vis the U.S. And in terms of how China would react, uh, I think China is now struggling. The fact that they've abstained in the General Assembly and the sort of the Security Council sort of highlights that. It's really difficult to de to defend the excellent. Sino uh, Ru Russia relations right now, despite, I mean, in light of the fact that, you know, Russia has taken that aggressive attitude. It's, it's very difficult to, to sort of uh, justify that without any hesitation. But would that damage the uh, uh, Sino Russian relations? I think it would not, because China also see a existential struggle uh, with the US and the Western nations. And in that context, they need a partner. And Russia is one of the few partners. You know, they're, 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 never, they're not going to become allies, but they're a partner that shares the same enemy. So I think that would uh, sort of uh, keep Russia and, and uh, uh, China together. But I think China would try to sort of differentiate uh, themselves from Russia that, you know, we're not like a rogue nation as Russia. We're more responsible. And, and I did tell this in my remarks as well, but what I'm worried is that some in the US might jump, jump onto that and say that, you know, Russia is a outlawed nation, but China is not. So maybe there's a potential for uh, a US and other countries to cooperate with China on issues like global warming, and you know pandemics and all that, and China would try to sort of you know uh, 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 redefine their image as a responsible sort of uh, country, which they are not. So I'm a bit worried about that trend. And uh, about the third uh, question, uh, what was the third? Uh, did I answer the third question as well? Indirectly, the question was about uh, the prospects of China reacting to Russia's request for economic and military aid. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So, in a way, China might become a sort of a sanction breaker, right? Uh, the spoiler, if you will. And you know, China is a, a big enough country to spoil, you know, the uh, you know the, the collective collective actions of the West and you know the other countries. In sanctioning Russia, so that is a big worry. So, the burden is on us. What do we do then when China breaks that or is a spoiler of that sanction? Are we determined to punish China? So that's a big question for us. I'm pretty sure that China would delicately 
not in a straightforward manner, but delicately spoil the sanctions that, that we've established. So the burden is on us, what then we would do. And if we punish China in some way, it would have a major effect because the, just the sheer size of China's economy, the impact would be much bigger than sa sanctions on Russia. So can we stick together, right? That's, that's the issue. And uh, I don't know the answer, but uh, you know, uh, in order for the sanctions to Russia to be effective, there may be a sort of a situation where we have to deal with you know, the spoilers attitude of China. Thank you very much. Uh, the, uh, I'm now opening the floor for the questions. Uh, if you would like to ask, uh, yes, uh, uh, please raise your hand and uh, introduce yourself and um, my colleagues will give you the microphone. Uh, the first question goes to our own senior fellow, Kaha Gugulashvili, over there. Yes. <clears throat> well, thank you very much uh, for interesting uh, ideas. Um, I would like to ask a question to Professor Nakayama as well. Um, uh, I think that um, when uh, US, uh, Australia, and uh, the UK decided to create this AUKUS, this uh, military alliance actually, it irritated strongly China, understanding that this could be directed against China. The same type of irritation like Russia is irritated for the NATO expansion. And just a few days ago, I heard uh, from the foreign minister of China, uh, it's like he's saying uh, uh, a declaration, uh, not warning, but uh, expressing uh, some concerns about creation of of any kind of military alliance which could be considered as against China. So um, I think in this moment when I uh, um <coughs> exactly because of this, this kind of problem, Russia started war against uh, not just Ukraine but about against NATO al <coughs> alliance, I think. Uh, the warning from side of China it seems a little, um, little bit straightforward threat to my view. Do you think that this can be starting of China's uh, somehow coordinated policy with Russia? So Russia attacks the West because of military alliances they create and China attacks uh, US, again West, but um, political West because it includes Australia. Uh, so, and uh, what we can expect from China in these regards? This is one question, and second question is about the importance of Taiwan in this uh, moment. Um, as, as we know, 80% of uh, semiconductors or chips, so-called the electronic uh, devices, um, the electronic components for, for any kind of devices, including military, uh, missiles, etc., is produced in Taiwan. And Russia now is facing quite important uh, challenge with this, that Taiwan is on the side of the Western world, uh, together with Japan and others as well. Uh, so would it be also accelerating the China's um, intention to invade Taiwan and uh, own these kind of facilities uh, in order to be able also to produce these semiconductors that, that is produced in Taiwan. Thank you. Well, thank you for the question. I'm sure, you know, uh, uh, David and, and Professor Hirose has uh, their own perspective as well. So I, I hope, you know, they can jump in. But and I, I think I can sort of combine uh, the two questions into the issue of uh, Taiwan. And, you know, in Japan, after what happened in uh, Ukraine, uh, we sort of talked about how applicable the situation is. Right? Would China do the same thing? Because, you know, uh, establishing sphere of influence through force is accepted in Europe. Would they sort of uh, learn that it's also possible in, you know, the Western Pacific? 
I, I briefly touched on that topic in my remarks, but you know, in the U.S., there's a concept called non, uh, 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 major non-NATO ally, MNNA. You know, Japan is included. And although Taiwan is not a sovereign state, it's de facto a major non-NATO ally. And US has been constantly sending China that if you change the status quo using force, US would react. The allies would, in the region would react. We have Japan, well, Japan is not that you know, forward leaning on that. Uh, sort of, you know, uh, issue because we have constitutional restraint, but U.S. has surely uh, constantly been telling the, the, the China that, you know, changing the status quo using force is not acceptable. So in that sense, I think Taiwan with it is within, you know, in, in the context of Europe, is within the NATO membership country. So we're not that worried about, you know, you know uh, uh, the Ukraine situation, it's sort of directly applicable to our region. But also, but, but, but surely, uh, uh, you know, ch as China gets stronger, there's a worry whether, you know, Chinese, China could be deterred, right? So there's a multiple arrangement to sort of complicate China's hegemonic ambitions. It's not con to contain it, but to complicate China's he hegemonic ambitions. Quad is one of them. It's not a military alliance. It's, it's more about sort of diplomatic cooperation. You know, it, it even sort of deals with you know, the pandemic, the vaccines. Uh, uh, free in Indo-Pacific is one of them. It's to show the desirable shape of all that that we prefer, and hopefully countries in the region would prefer. And there's a multiple sort of uh, layers of you know uh, bilateral security alliance, U.S.-Japan security alliance, ROK, U.S.-Japan alliance, Australia and, and U.S. and AUKUS would fill in that gap as well. So there's a multiple web of, of alliance that complicates China's rise. As long as we're determined to maintain, upgrade those hubs, I think we're pretty good as of now. But the thing is, as I said in my remarks, if you think about post-Putin Russia, uh, maybe we can think about an optimistic sort of a, a, a view about Russia. Not totally, but as Professor Hirose said, this war is Putin's war not Russia's war, right? But in case of China, it's the country, it's the regime, it's the communist party of China. So it's systemic. In that sense, we're playing a long game here in our region. It's not like 10 years, not even 20 years. It may go beyond 2050. Can we maintain our strength? We have to, but that is our task and that is our difficulty. So it's not a full answer, but uh, that's as far as I can say. Thank you very much indeed. Before I give uh, uh, the member of the audience the opportunity to ask for the next question, may I actually ask a question to Professor Hirose and Dr. Uh, Gogneshvili? Uh, in the context of ongoing events, dramatic events, uh, in the short and medium term, what do you see, see as the uh, area of opportunity for bilateral relations between Georgia and Japan? What do you th think could be uh, the areas which, for instance, the Georgian government could promote for widening and deepening bilateral relations? Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, yes, um, I think um, there are so many ways uh, that uh, we can uh, cooperate uh, to the um, development of this region. Um, as I said, uh, Georgia is a very important hub of this uh, region. Uh, you have a great um, 
road and a railroad, and uh, you have uh, a great port uh, at uh, Black Sea. And now Black Sea is very important uh, sea uh, to think about uh, not only uh, Caucasus region, but also Eurasia, um, because uh, China's uh, uh, belt of uh, uh, one road and uh, one belt uh, one belt uh, project. Uh, they, this is the uh, transportation uh, using the um, fleet uh, using a uh, uh, proxy. It's very important. Uh, in addition, uh, now uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine uh, under the uh, war. So uh, the Georgia's importance uh, has been uh, much uh, more important uh, than before. Uh, in addition, uh, Japan uh, is trying to uh, make a great uh, success um, on the connectivity uh, between uh, Japan and the uh, European countries. Then. Uh, the uh, Georgian uh, position is very important uh, to connect uh, between uh, Japan and uh, Europe. So um, we can use uh, your uh, very important uh, um, situation. Uh, so uh, we can cooperate uh, to use uh, many resources. Uh, then uh, we can cooperate to uh, um, prosperity of this region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Goginashvili, if you have any suggestions about um, the well, perspective. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. First of all, uh, I'd like to apologize. Apparently, there was a problem with my sound. I did not even notice that. So uh, I hope you can hear me now well. Um, I would like to break this question into two dimensions that I would for, bilateral and multilateral, I would say. Uh, in the bilateral uh, relations, uh, the economic cooperation would be uh, the thing that both countries should aspire to, especially free trade agreement is something that would help Georgia a lot uh, to enter Japanese market and compete uh, with European products, for example, uh, or uh, like if you take wines, for example, uh, all the major winemaker company, uh, the countries have uh, free trade agreement in with Japan, while uh, Georgia does not. Uh, so that's uh, the direction that I think we should uh, work to, uh, towards. And uh, within the multilateral framework, yes, definitely, as Professor Hiro said, uh, connectivity, uh, that is something that uh, we should work on, uh, especially the seabed cable going, going under the Black Sea, uh, connecting Romania and, and uh, Georgia. That would uh, fit the connectivity strategy perfectly well. <clears throat> and uh, uh, there is a space for cooperation in this di direction as well. And uh, uh, there is something new coming in the energy field. Uh, uh, which is not explored uh, well, uh, but uh, people say that the next next step of the energy development can be the hydrogen and green hydrogen. Uh, from the point of view that Georgia provides 80% uh, green energy, uh, making hydrogen here and then uh, in Georgia, I would not here. I'm in Japan now. Uh, making hydrogen in Georgia and using uh, existing pipeline infrastructure to export this hydrogen seems like a lucrative uh, opportunity for for the Japanese companies. And I think that uh, JBIC as well and Japanese Bank of International Cooperation would will would be willing to engage 
in this kind of cooperation. So energy sphere is also something that would cooperate. We could cooperate really successfully as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, Tia. Oh, maybe Ivan Yatze on the foundation. Thank you for this interesting dis discussion. And uh, I have a question with Professor Nag Nagayama. Uh, uh, you already mentioned uh, Quad, and uh, I, I want to know your opinion. Do you think that in face of Russian uh, aggr Russia's invasion of Ukraine, do you think that in the medium or uh, long term uh, it is possible that co quad quadrilateral security dialogue of US, Japan, and India, and Australia, that it might uh, grow into a military alliance? Because uh, we see that uh, also in February for statement of Russia and um, China, they, uh, they mentioned that they were uh, against NATO enlargement, but they also said that they were against of alliances or military blocks uh, in Indo-Pacific. And do you think that, uh, uh, I, th I think that uh, for like firstly, Taiwan's question is number one, uh, number one security st threat for Indo-Pacific. And do you think that uh, this this might be a good alternative to oppose China's uh, China's rights and its hegemony in the re region in the Pacific at first. Thank you. Well, thank you for that <coughs> question. I think question was about whether Quad would develop into a military alliance, which I would not think it would. Uh, uh, Quad is a uh, a sort of more of a uh, foreign policy coordinating mechanism rather than a military alliance. Uh, clearly, India is not comfortable with it. Japan may have some sort of, you know, uh, hesitance if it develops into a military sort of, you know, arrangement. So I think there's a agreement that Quad is a, uh, a tool for coordinating a foreign policy that would uphold liberal international order in this region. And the military alliances are sort of set, set apart from, from, from Quad. Like I said, the bilateral sort of alliance and framework like uh, the AUKUS and all that. And in terms of Quad uh, sort of having impl implications beyond Indo-Pacific, I think it showed the difficulty in uh, a recent uh, sort of, you know, India's attitude toward uh, Russia. And, uh, you know, they've abstained in the uh, General Assembly uh, when they voted for the resolution. Uh, also in the Security Council as, as well. So uh, because of, you know, uh, close ties uh, 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 that India has with Russia, especially uh, uh, the, the purchase of, of the weapons. So the Quad is not going to have a global implication. It's not going to have a sort of a military sort of uh, aspect. But again, I will stress that it's, it's, a, it's a coordinating tool for foreign policy. And I think that works well. And if we try to develop a Quad s s into a military sort of framework, I think there would be a hard pushback from China that you know these countries are trying to militarize the region and all that. But we have a sort of enough arrangement already, and we're trying to sort of beef up those arrangements. You know, there's an attempt by the US and Japan, US and Korea, and US and Australia to sort of you know improve the uh, the capability of the alliance. And again, coordinating. You know, uh, uh, you know the, the 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 bilateral relations with other bilateral relations, and also we're uh, uh, trying to improve relations with you know U.S. allies like Australia. Korea is a missing missing link, but you know India. So so you know those hub of relations is an alternative to a institutional multilateral military alliance, and I think that's working well and and i personally think that we should not aim for a nato like 
sort of uh, sort of you know, alliance in our part of the world. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Uh, thank you. We actually have run out of uh, time, but we have a, one final question, if it can be brief and brief answer. Please. Yes. Um, I'm Alex Petriashvili. Thank you very much uh, to all speakers for your excellent presentations. My question goes to uh, Professor Hiroshi and uh, Mr. Goginashvili. You spoke about the uh, possibilities uh, of the uh, Georgia-Japanese cooperation basically on economic front. And um, a while ago, there was a very good project, uh, an Aklia um, uh, port, a deep sea port project, and uh, Japan, Japan had the interest uh, towards the, um, uh, this uh, project and was uh, somehow participating also in this project. Um, after the war in... Uh, 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 Ukraine, you know, Russia's invasion in Ukraine, the supply chain uh, uh, issue and the uh, sea, deep sea ports importance has increased. Uh, could we uh, expect that Japanese uh, interest could be uh, increasing again uh, towards uh, Anaklia deep sea ports project? Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Yeah, actually, um, economic front is very important here to think about our, our uh, cooperative relations. Uh, actually, uh, Japan uh, tried to uh, improve uh, Georgian infrastructure, including uh, road and so on. And, and actually, I, I think. Uh, and the Korea project is very important, uh, important project, and uh, Japan can cooperate to the um, success of the Korea project. Um, however, I heard that um, Ch Chinese government is really interested in the Korea project. If so, uh, it's not easy to um, and uh, to enter uh, this pro project for uh, Japanese companies. So. Um, I think uh, we should um, make Korea a uh, situation of the Korea project. However, if uh, we can have a spare to enter this uh, project, uh, Japan should enter uh, the project, and we can uh, we can give the great uh, technology uh, to success the um, development of Korea project. I think uh, Korea project is very important key for the development uh, to uh, make uh, uh, international infra infrastructure for the Georgian government, although um, it had a um, great, um, great uh, difficulty uh, after the uh, Sarkozy government. Uh, so uh, it is great uh, pleasure for us uh, to cooperate uh, to the Anaglia project. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Petrieshvili. I think that is also one of the projects that uh, two countries can work together on. Um, and yes, as you said, Japan had an interest in the in the project. Um, I even helped Tedo Japaridze, former diplomat of Georgia, who then, um, uh, as far as I remember, he was working as a special advisor in an Aklia consortium or something like that, but Japanese side invited him. And, and uh, he held meetings and I was just helping with the translation, but anyway, uh, and the, the meetings were aimed on establishing some time, ties between two sides that would later in the future lead uh, towards deeper Japanese involvement in the project. But um, I think there should be readiness from, from the Georgian government as well to accept uh, Japanese uh, investments. Uh, but on the other side, uh, Japanese foreign policy-wise, and uh, from the point of view of, 
of uh, connectivity with the e European Union, that project is something that can be very interesting for Japan, from Japanese government as well as for, for Japanese uh, private sector. Thank you. Thank you, and with this I would like to ask uh, our audience to join me in thanking our wonderful presenters and also on behalf of the uh, Rondelli Foundation, I would like to express my hope that uh, you will lend us your wisdom and expertise in our future endeavors and events. Thank you very much indeed. Recording stopped. Uh, we have a short coffee break. Uh, we're slightly behind our schedule, so we'll be back in, in, in a few minutes. Uh, uh, obviously, we'll let you enjoy your coffee, but please obey our colleagues when they will instruct you to come back.
this. Uh, we have good speakers, not, not less important and less good speakers than in the first panel, but uh, still um, I have a challenge to, to do my job. So <coughs> the second panel is uh, about Georgia's foreign policy objectives. Um, so with regards to relationship with Japan, uh, and in general... Recording in progress. Thank you. Um, and uh, of course about uh, Georgia's uh, role and place in the international uh, security system. Um, so first I would like to ask uh, uh, my friend and colleague uh, Tengiz Khaladze who used to be the uh, foreign policy advisor to the president, Margulashvili, um, and uh, in that uh, period of time, uh, the relationship with uh, Japan uh, have uh, been intensified, and um, I would like to ask him uh, to enlighten us about the uh, Georgia-Japanese relationship uh, and the perspectives of Georgia-Japanese uh, relationship, the importance of Japan for Georgia. Please, Tango, floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure and privilege to be here uh, today, and especially we are celebrating now 30 years of uh, our dip diplomatic relationship. And uh, uh, it's also challenging to be here in this specific time uh, because uh, the entire world has been changed. And before I answer your question, let me once again express my, my support, not only my, but our support with our Ukrainian brothers and sisters. Uh, mm, Japan and Georgian relations, it's really very interesting because from, uh, from the, let's say, first side, we are countries so far apart and I mean geographically and uh, uh, in the first glance there, there is no direct connection between uh, those uh, countries but at the same time we are very close to each other and uh, uh, first of all because of uh, dedication of values and uh, Japan as well as Georgia, we are so committed to the, let's say, global West. Uh, and when it comes to uh, pillars of the statehood, it's always, uh, and nation's choice is always uh, liberal democracy, that's a free market, that's a uh, rule of law and so on so on so that's why I think that's the main pillar of our relationship and I would say determinant and I remember during the visit you already mentioned in 2014 and the later when the Japanese foreign minister was in Georgia he said that uh, the main wealth of our nations and this by the way uh, by the way this is quite interesting parallel because neither Georgia nor Japan is reach for uh, oil or gas. And he said that uh, the main wealth is are our citizens. And I think uh, the, uh, one of the direction in our relationship, and I'm really happy that that direction it develops, it's about trainings and education because uh, Japan is not just a country which transfers, let's say, know-how. It transfers know-how uh, modern management, team working, work ethic, and so on. And that's very important. At the same time, we are nations which suffering and uh, has very painful experience to be annexed. The, uh, the, the part of Georgia, it's still under occupation uh, and sweeping annexation. And Japan knows what does it mean because northern territories of Japan are annexed. So that's why we understand each other quite well. And by the way, that's why Japan understands so well uh, Ukraine. And uh, Japan's contribution, Japanese contribution and uh, firm position uh, in regard of uh, Ukraine uh, is uh, essential. 
Japan is the country which contributes a lot in the international security, and they are also sheer responsibilities because Georgia is one of the, uh, let's say, uh, committed contributor in the international security, be in Afghanistan or other missions, what, but during those 30 years we have proved that we are uh, contributing and we are provider of the international security. And uh, of course, and this is my fourth point, that's about the development, welfare, and um, prosperity of the nations. And in this regard, uh, uh, Georgia's role uh, as a Eastern European country which bridges uh, uh, Europe and Asian market is really important. And Georgia is the country which gives uh, uh, aid uh, from 14 uh, landlocked countries uh, access to the seashore. In this regard, uh, it's very interesting for uh, Japanese business. And I remember in 2014 when we had this meeting with uh, uh, business community, they were so impressed and interested in developing Anaclia Deep Sport. Regrettably, today we are uh, talking about that as a almost wishful thinking. But I remember how um, much uh, interest uh, that raised uh, in 2014. However, Japan uh, contributes a lot in development of infrastructural projects and so on. By the way, when the world's interest is so much uh, focused on Chinese Belt and Road initiatives, Japan is the country which and investors which provide, once again, I repeat that, not just know-how, but also excellent management and quality. Uh, I'd like to use this opportunity and once again thank uh, Japanese government and uh, people for their support uh, in name recognition policy. Uh, and we always uh, uh, have uh, quite strong support uh, from their government and very important that uh, oh, maybe I'm, uh, I think it was 2011 but maybe I mix up with, uh, with the date but Japanese they also recognize status neutral document which is uh, also very important uh, in Georgia's uh, policy towards occupied territories. And last but not least, uh, I remember our request uh, to change the name of the country because uh, in official documents it was Gruzia and we asked to change Georgia and Japanese government was so, uh, so cooperative in this regard. Uh, today speaking about perspectives, uh, I mean Georgia despite all complications we have today uh, Georgia is the country which creates opportunities, opportunities for cooperation. And first of all, this is the CFTA, um, and, but at the same time, free, to agree, free trade agreements with other countries. So from the one part, Georgia is a very small market and uh, uh, any investor should think twice why should invest in such kind of small market and plus um, political risks of occupation because 40 kilometers from the Tbilisi, the Russian occupants and so on. But at the same time, this small country generates huge opportunities because of those free trade agreements. Connectivity, uh, infrastructural projects, which is not just east, between East and Western Georgia, but this is really about the East and West connectivity. And if we are talking about some alternative routes of connectivity between the eastern and western markets, Georgia, despite that this is the small country, it plays significant role. Because if you close this very narrow corridor on, uh, on the Georgian territory, that means that you control all transportation routes and uh, all, I mean, oil and gas resources and resources from Central Asia, Caspian Basin and so, so on. That's why uh, it's really important and we have a lot to offer to uh, our Japanese partners. So I will stop here and uh, ready to, for the next question. <laughs>
Let me ask uh, right away, uh, thank you for your presentation and uh, very important remarks. What should Georgia do uh, to intensify uh, uh, relationship with Japan and uh, attract uh, Japanese companies in Georgia and Japanese investment? Thank you so much. I think this is the uh, very, very important, uh, uh, not just important, but very timely question. Because uh, today, uh, uh, if Georgia really looks for opportunity, today we should think what to do together um, to uh, support development of the trade and commercial relationship uh, between East and West, especially now when we have uh, see collapse of Russian markets and so on, so on. That's why I mentioned these opportunities of free trade agreement just imagine that, I mean, so many Japanese companies, they were uh, on the Russian market and they were, uh, I, I mean, not just exist on Russian market, but they had headquarters, regional headquarters in Russia. So uh, if Georgia can and or will offer uh, the really suitable condition for, for investors, uh, I think it's possible to, to have Georgia as a regional hub for, uh, for the regional business. But once again, and I, let, let me reiterate this point uh, where I started from that the pillar of our relationship is uh, uh, liberal democracy, free market, rule of law, values. So without that, it's impossible to do anything. Because that business, that country, always looks for committed partner. So Georgia's goal should be use the opportunities generated by association agreement, uh, opportunities generated by DCFTA, by uh, strategic chart with the United States and other agreements which supports and contributes in country's transformation. And those reforms about democracy, this is not just, let's say, just homework. This is contribution in country's welfare because every uh, business, every investor looks for human rights, uh, court system, judicial system, rule of law, free market, and so on. Providing services, transforming country in the really modern function in European democracy. This is the direct way to strengthen relationship with Georgia and Japan and make Georgia a real regional hub. Thank you, Tango. As always, very straightforward, very strong statements uh, from you. Next on my list is my colleague, as I told you, and my friend, uh, senior fellow at Rondelli Foundation, uh, former ambassador to United Kingdom, long-time uh, diplomat, uh, Georgi Badridze. Uh, Georgi, the toughest question is to you. Uh, about Georgia's place in the international uh, world order in this uh, particular challenging times. How it looks in your view uh, from outside? What is uh, Georgia doing uh, uh, to uh, make stronger its positions uh, in this um, period of time when uh, the Russia invasion in Ukraine uh, creates uh, troubles for the entire world, but also creates opportunities. And um, last but not least uh, question, uh, the, the first panel there was a discussion about the uh, major non-NATO ally uh, status. Uh, I would like to hear your view about that. Uh, uh, is it applicable to Georgia? Is it um, foreseeable for Georgia? And uh, I will stop here and 
to shut up and thank you. <laughs> give thank the floor you. to you. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, sometimes question can be even more interesting than the uh, answer in the presentation, and this is clearly the case. Um, if someone just came to the Earth from outer space and then looked at George's position, they would immediately see that uh, we are in a very hard predicament. Um, however, all four of us actually are uh, former practitioners and also people who have been uh, thinking and working uh, for Georgia's national security uh, and uh, interests for, for decades. Well, I belong to a generation actually which uh, graduated at the very time when Georgia was becoming independent and I personally was somehow uh, surprisingly to me uh, invited by the newly created Ministry of Foreign Affairs out of my classroom at the university. Uh, by the way, those uh, who are connoisseurs uh, of Jap Japanese history and uh, Western Japanese relations um, would know uh, uh, for sure uh, uh, a great British diplomat, uh, Anne Sato. Uh, yesterday, actually, I was speaking about his book um, called Diplomatic Practice, which he wrote in 1917, uh, and it remains a textbook for not just British diplomats, but everyone who wants to understand diplomacy. It's been uh, re-edited and issued and issued all over again until recently. It's still a very important, probably the most important uh, uh, book on how diplomacy is practiced. And, and again, the connection here is uh, not just his connection to Japan. Uh, he was sent to Japan as a young man and he became minister uh, at the British Embassy and then he became the ambassador. Uh, well, to me this was an inspirational path because I was actually taken into Georgian diplomacy out of my university and also I served as a minister to a major country before becoming ambassador there. So, we, we all have been living and working for a country which has been on living on a knife's edge for its entire independent history. It's not that is happening just now. And if you look what we have been saying and writing about Georgia's national security, about Georgia's position in the uh, ever-changing system of international relations, uh, to us, uh, Russia's uh, craziness is not sudden or un unexpected. Okay, those who say that Putin suddenly went crazy and acts uh, out of his own character. Yes, he may have um, kind of shown some symptoms of aggravation, but uh, the disease was there from the start. If you look what he's been uh, up to since early 2000s, how he has been uh, basically coordinating the uh, creation of the new so-called Eurasian ideology, what is written there? It's all there. What Russia does today, uh, it simply does with greater rigor and pro probably greater self-destructiveness, but it is all that is enshrined uh, black on white in the some kind of Russian uh, Putin's Mein Kampf or Putin's ideology which has been created with the help of Dugin. So, the Georgia's predicament has been difficult from the outset. Many, we blame them, by the way, for this. Uh, many did not realize and later re prefer to ignore what Russia has been doing to Georgia since 1991. This should have been a clue. And by the way, this was not a secret, including in the West. He, as early as in 93, uh, Kissinger, who is deeply relevant to all of our discussion with China, Russia, etc., Kissinger wrote that he understood that Russia needed to be aided in the process of democratization, but uh, turning, and I'm quoting, turning a blind eye to Russia's imperial behavior in its neighborhood, uh, would not help 
the Russian reform, but rather harm it. And this is exactly what happened. And, and uh, well, ironically, these were the Democrats and liberals at the time, um, uh, liberally minded people who chose some kind of strange misguided realpolitik with, with Yeltsin first, and later then we saw the same uh, with, with uh, uh, next uh, administrations who only later realized that things are not as they appear in Russia, they never are. Although if you pay attention, I mean, there were all the clues. So Georgia's situation from the outset was fight for its survival as a reborn independent nation. The, uh, one of the disadvantages in this fight is on us. We shouldn't blame this on anyone else. And it is our uh, failure, I would not, maybe it's not a, a total failure, but our, uh, the, the deficiencies in internally in putting a robust, resilient, democratic system. Uh, our excuse was that we had so many external challenges. Uh, it was Russia, of course, which uh, tried to mess up the internal situation with the armed coup uh, in the late 91, then with the uh, conflict in Abkhazia, as I said. There were so many excuses, but it is primarily on us first that not at any stage or in our development, well, there were some successes at various periods of time, but we have not even up to this moment put together a resilient, strong democracy based on rule of law. This could have helped us enormously. When you looked at Georgia and three Baltic republics in the early 90s, you should not have any questions why they received greater degree of solidarity and assistance, and we less. And this was not some kind of conspiracy, which is all, all, quite often blamed on Reagan and Gorbachev, that Gorbachev conceded Baltics and uh, America, uh, Bush won, or even Clinton actually conceded Caucasus to uh, the new Russia. This was not the case, it was on us. Okay? We, we look differently from, from that. The today, Okay, and this is, uh, this, well, this took me a bit uh, longer than I expected. It was more lyrical than factual, what I've said so far. Well, today Georgia is in a critical um, moment in its history. The global uh, system of international relations, global order, is changing dramatically. Uh, it's been changing most of the time of, for our independence, but now we are very close to the formation of a more stable and lasting uh, global order. And the danger today is that Georgia could find itself on the wrong side of the newly creating, uh, created uh, lines of divisions. And sadly, there will be lines of division, could, could even, uh, be something like the Iron Curtain. Uh, what Russia does, I mean, it, it's, it creates the, uh, uh, something that could very, very closely resemble that Iron Curtain. And we have, sadly, uh, have not ensured our position in the new global order. And current uh, behavior of Georgia is not necessarily reassuring uh, to us uh, personally, and probably to our allies, that uh, Georgia's position is, is uh, completely clear where it wants to be. Yes, well, on, on the level of declarations, Georgia continues its uh, alliance with the West, but is it enough what we do? Uh, is uh, the careful posture uh, that is evident today is sufficient to secure Georgia in terms of not becoming Russia's an immediate or next target? I'm not quite sure. And with this, I will end and leave more room for questions. Um, we live through historic moment. 
uh, Georgia needs, of course, caution, uh, very uh, calculated uh, political decisions, but also decisions that should be based on realization that our fate could be sealed in the very near future. And uh, passivity or neutrality is not an option. Thank you. Thank you, Georgi. It was a kind of a very, very in-depth lecture of uh, Georgia's and uh, world diplomacy uh, history. But I'm an NATO guy. Everyone knows that. And I cannot let you without uh, answering the question about non-NATO major allies status uh, question. Sorry about is that. Is it foreseeable for Georgia? And well, is it applicable? Thank you. Um, speaking of lectures, I could actually give you a lecture on the pros and cons. Uh, and uh, this status comes with many advantages and also with some disadvantages. Uh, United States has a number of non-NATO major allies. Japan is one. But Japan has never had an option of joining NATO. So on the pro, of course, you would be told that Georgia's uh, prospect of joining NATO in the near or even uh, not so near future is not there, okay? Just uh, a couple of weeks ago, a few days before Russia actually launched this war, German Chancellor reiterated German veto allowed uh, in the Kremlin during his meeting with President Putin, saying that as long as he's in power, I, Georgia uh, and Ukraine, well, NATO will, would not expand, okay? As if it was NATO expansion that motivated Putin, which is simply just the wrong premise. But it is the reality that in 2008, uh, with all due respect to my colleagues who presented the promise of NATO to, to include Georgia and Ukraine at the time at the Bucharest summit as a major achievement, in reality what happened is that Germany then blocked the only practical path of Georgia uh, of joining NATO, and it's still not available to us today. So many would argue that non-NATO ally status would compensate uh, a certain degree of security in the absence of immediate prospect of joining NATO. But at the same time, um, based on the practice so far, the the status which does not come with the same degree of security protection and guarantees, although that they would be significant, I guess, it comes with practical end to Georgia's NATO membership prospect in the future. So here are the very, in, in a nutshell, pros and cons. Uh, if I were asked to uh, provide a uh, kind of advice to current or future Georgian government. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I'm not prepared to make the judgment at this moment. It needs much more in-depth discussion within the Georgian national security community, diplomats, uh, everyone, and also the consultations with our allies. Thank you, Georgi. In your presentation and answering the questions, you again prove that the, the quality and uh, uh, your um, experience in diplomacy and I thank you very much uh, for your answers and your, for your presentation. Now uh, we should go to uh, Georgi Bilanishvili who is a research fellow at um, Rondelli Foundation and um, the Georgi's experience is uh, to deal with uh, national security, and the, um, national security and democracy, how it works together, uh, what is done, what is sh what should be done, um, and uh, what is not done yet. 
Georgi, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. First of all, I should admit that it is a great honor for me to be part of this panel with very distinguished participants. Unfortunately, the modern world is prominent with its vulnerable security environment and multiplying nature of the hybrid threats. The most common feature of the current world order, which can be titled as undefined multipolarity, multipolarity is a continuous attempt of the rising authoritarian powers to widen their sphere of influence at the expense of other sovereign states. International institutions which have been created on, in order to maintain peace and stability in the world and protect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the sovereign states within their internationally recognized borders are mostly incapable to carry out their mission. That is what we are currently witnessing in Ukraine, where Russia is conducting its unjustified, unprovoked full-scale invasion and military aggression, which continues for already 19 days. Also, the civilized world did its best to prevent this aggression. Unfortunately, they failed. This effort failed. Even now, when absolute ma majority of the states, absolute majority of the states are condemning Russian aggression against Ukraine and try to provide support to Ukraine in order to help its government and people in their fight from freedom and sovereignty, which they do with unbelievable courage, bravery, and love for their country. There is no sufficient international legal mechanism uh, to stop Russian aggression. In these circumstance, circumstances, building up coherent national security policy in order uh, to ensure its own security seems more than relevant, especially for the small states like Georgia. Indeed, this has been an area where our partners have invested largely in order to enhance capability and capacity of Georgian state. But government of Georgia, uh, as, it is common, as it commonly happens with us, never had been prudent and hardworking student prone to fulfill its own homework. However, it should be mentioned that we have had some achievement in the field of national security planning. In 2005, the first national security concept was elaborated by the government and approved by Georgian parliament. Then in 2007, the first threat assessment document was also elaborated and adopted by the Georgian government. However, Russian military invasion in, 2000, uh, uh, in August of 2008 showed that we were far behind from the development of, of the coherent national security policy planning process, and our national security system Mal malfunctioned during the war. After the war, our partners still accumulated their effort in order to help Georgia to fulfill all the gaps and improve the faults, which as we already mentioned, has been clearly shown on the background of Russian military aggression into Georgia. With the assistance of our partners, national security, uh, security policy review process was initiated at the beginning of 2009. The focus of the process was as follows. To enhance interagency cooperation and consolidate interagency working process in the field of national security uh, planning, this was the uh, first. Second was to enhance capacities and capabilities of those institutions which are core part of national security policy planning of Georgia. And the third was to involve in the process of the national security planning, not only all, all the relevant governmental institutions, but uh, representatives of larger but uh, relevant 
segment of GeoGIS community, like experts in this field, representatives of the think tank community, other, uh, other non-governmental organizations, and even opposition parties. As a result of new cycle, as a result, the new cycle of national security policy planning started in Georgia at the end of 2009. In 2010, a new threat assessment document has been developed and adopted by Georgian government. And then in 2011, a new national security concept was elaborated and approved by parliament. At this stage, some progress was quite evident. Then uh, we came to the 2012, the year of 2012, which was well, the most important uh, time in our recent history is that Georgia, for the first time, achieved power shifts through the parliamentary election. Uh, opposition, then opposition Georgian Dream won the election and uh, the uh, ruling party, National Movement, went to the opposition. Uh, following the parliamentary elections, the new constitution was enforced in Georgia, and according to this new constitution, all responsibilities about the national security policy went from the president to the pri prime minister. I mean, uh, uh, foreign policy, defense policy, economic policy, and so on and so forth. Wow. But the National Security Plan uh, Council and its office, which has a crucial role in national security policy planning, was left under the, under the president of Georgia. At the end of 2013, uh, Georgian Dream established like a parallel council titled uh, State Security and Crisis Management Council, and the office of this council has uh, had become in charge of the planning of national security policy. Uh, the first effort was diverted to develop new threat assessment document, and this document was elaborated in the process of interagency working group and published at the end of 2015 with four-year term, uh, which expired in 2018. Uh, also, at that time, at that time, a legislation was approved by uh, Georgian parliament, uh, um, which is uh, uh, the law is about planning and coordination of the national security policy, which is, which first time established framework for the national policy planning in Georgia. Uh, but this was, to my understanding, very tiny progress. Largely, uh, state security and crisis management council failed, failed to, <laughs> to uh, meet uh, expectations and goals uh, in the field of national security policy planning. And the most vivid example is that uh, we still have national security, co uh, national security cons concept which was uh, adopted by our parliament in 2011. After 2011, uh, many things has changed in and around Georgia. We had annexation of Crimea. We had military invasion in 2015 in eastern part of Ukraine by Russia. We had rising of terrorist organization and terrorist threat in the Middle East. And uh, also we have very troublesome developments in a Karabakh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Uh, if we assume that all the things uh, had not happened, major things have been done. That is a power shift, shift in Georgia. We had new ruling party, which has new policy uh, as they themselves declared toward Russia. This is so-called uh, 
constructive or non-irritating policy and uh, only considering this pact, we should have adopted new, new national security cons concept. The latest development is that in 2019, new National Security Council's uh, office was charged to develop the new national security concept of Georgia. They just finalized their task at the end of the last year, but taking into consideration the development in, in Ukraine, this national security concept, the draft of national security concept needs substantial amendments. Uh, uh, what about, I, 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 I'd like to say a few words about democracy and uh, in this regard, I'd like to go back to the year of 2012. Uh, uh, democracy for Georgia is very, very, uh, very important thing because for my country, ha it has internal as well as external dimension to my understanding. Because without being establishing as a consolidated democracy, Georgia would not be able to become part of European and Euro-Atlantic institutions. 2012 was prominent in this regard, uh, as power shifts is a characteristic of, through the parliamentary election is, is, a, is one of the main future of democracy. Uh, Georgian dream leaders promised Georgian people to create Georgia uh, in a such a democratic country that established democracy will wander and follow our exams. Uh, some amendments have been done in, in regard of human rights in, uh, in our legi legislation, which was also promising. But then as 2016 parliamentary elections approached, it has become evident that the priority of Georgian dream has shifted substantially and has become to focus, to create environment favorable just to maintain their power, which uh, they follow up to, up to date. Uh, another thing uh, very, very worrisome personally for me is that uh, the key institutions of which play a crucial role in national security policy planning has been shifted to meet the agenda of the Georgian dream. Last year, uh, files, a lot of files we are leaked, uh, we are leaked in a, in an internet and these files uh, contained recording of, of uh, tapping and recording uh, many people starting from bishop and ending with ordinary people which has nothing to do with national security uh, policy. For me, this was additional proof to think that uh, the key institution uh, for the national security in the process of national security policy planning was diverted and tasked to assume the role of political po po police, uh, which is uh, one of the major character of the big states, and which is a uh, major future which underlines our level of democracy. That's briefly my answer to your question. Thank you, Georgi. <coughs> uh, I think um, someone, if, if still has some any questions about the national security uh, the concept and the national security architecture of Georgia, <coughs> uh, the best uh, uh, expert to answer this question is Georgi, uh, of course. Um, 
besides, he's uh, one of our best uh, experts uh, on Russia. Um, the his recent uh, uh, article about uh, the uh, Russia's narratives and uh, threats and narratives from Russia. I would like to elaborate, uh, you have to elaborate, but before that, I want to go, as I said, I'm a NATO guy. So before that, uh, I would like to uh, ask uh, Tengo about uh, uh, the status of non-NATO uh, uh, major ally. Uh, the professor who had an excellent, excellent presentation, really. Um, he didn't mention about Taiwan one uh, important thing. Uh, uh, United States has the uh, uh, strategic ambiguity uh, with the, uh, the Taiwan. So I, I doubt very much uh, that the, uh, if, if Taiwan, uh, <laughs> if China invades Taiwan, uh, there will be a clear immediate military reaction uh, in just because Taiwan has the uh, non-major status uh, ally, uh, non-major ally status. So what do you think? Uh, what is your view on this issue? And then uh, I will open the floor uh, for the questions. Alex, thank you so much. I think this is uh, more than a significant <laughs> question today, and I fully agree with my friend Georgi that uh, uh, it has pros and cons, uh, uh, but the most important that we are discussing, because we should discuss, and uh, uh, the the thing I r really don't like is that uh, there are discussions about Georgia, but quite often without Georgia. So, uh, and first thing I would like to stress and highlight that's the importance to have really proactive diplomacy. Not just l listening to the, some proposals, but create those proposals, because window of opportunity never granted. It should be crafted, and crafted by yourself, first of all. Uh, about the uh, uh, status, I remember four years ago, it, exactly it was the March, uh, visit uh, President Margulashvili to the United States, and I remember very similar discussions in U.S. Senate about the possibility um, uh, to grant Georgia NATO uh, non-member, uh, non-NATO non, non member ally status. Uh, and that was kind of triggered to generate Georgia's support act. Uh, but uh, once again, I mean, you have to be creative. Today, Ukraine is the shining example that you should think beyond the borders, beyond the patterns, think even, think unthinkable. Because, I mean, choose the very similar way as it was about the uh, uh, association agreement. Because association agreement, for instance, what Georgia and other aspirant countries has, and association agreements as it was before, despite of language similarity, wording similarity. There are two different things. So that's why the most important is that to look for other ways, not as the alternative to the NATO, but considering the, all the complications of the procedure, uh, think and look for the ways which can uh, somehow contribute in this process and speed up the acceleration. So if that status brings uh, guarantees for Georgia's defensibility, of course it will contribute in uh, Georgia's uh, NATO aspiration, but never consider, we never should consider this status as the alternative to NATO. So, uh, but once again, the most important is discussion, discussion, but not silence. Thank you. Thank you. I, I knew this answer, but um, I let you hear from Tango about the, uh, the answer uh, on this question. So now I open the floor uh, uh, to you to, the, uh, to give the questions to our 
uh, distinguished speakers and uh, please be active and uh, I see already him there. Hello everyone, my name is Georgi Pekashvili and I'm a student at Free University of Tbilisi. First of all, thank you for sharing your perspective on different political issues and I have a question about Taiwan. The ambassador Petrashvili mentioned Taiwan and while ago, and I want to know, in your opinion, what would be the most rational reaction from Georgian government if China invades Taiwan, just like Russia invaded Ukraine? Because as most of us here know, uh, Taiwan is an unrecognized state, and Georgia, United States, and even Japan do not recognize Taiwan as an independent state, and Every majority of countries in the world support Chinese territorial unity. So, in your opinion, what would be the most diplomatic and adequate reaction from Georgian government if this threat will be fulfilled? Thank you very much. Well, well, this is where uh, some diplomacy could help. I mean, obviously, Georgia's position. There are areas in the global politics where Georgia has this luxury of not needing to actively uh, kind of promote its position. Uh, Georgia would have to probably at some stage express its opinion about the uh, humanitarian and human costs of any uh, hard action, uh, but this is not necessarily unlike uh, any developments uh, in Ukraine or any anything involving Russia where Georgia uh, has to express uh, uh, its position. I, when I said that Georgia cannot afford neutrality, it's not an option, it is the case uh, primarily in the area of uh, European uh, security, uh, Black Sea security, uh, our region, our relations with Russia, and I'd be happy to elaborate because this is becoming uh, a trend. It has, it, it is a trend um, promoted from Moscow and pro-Russian groups here in Georgia, speaking about neutrality, deceiving uh, our population who do not uh, need to be experts in international security. Uh, and uh, if, if uh, I'm, I'm giving, I will, I will speak about this as well, but uh, on your question specifically, uh, <clears throat> Georgia may have its opinion. Uh, it may express its um, kind of regret uh, should, God forbid, something dramatic happens, but Georgia cannot, for instance, politically uh, join any political action uh, if China uh, it would try to implement its policy of territorial integrity. Georgia supports Chinese territorial in integrity. A very short remark that when it comes to, uh, to attitude, actions are a little bit different, but first you have to form and shape your attitude. And it's very complicated and very simple at the same time because uh, the best way to uh, shape your attitude it's uh, the basics of international law and international relationships. So you always have to stay for values. Expression, that's a different way. And I fully agree what Georgi already said. Uh, but once again, when the situation is too much tricky and dramatic, you always have to look to the basics. And basics are the pillars of the international law. By the way, including sovereignty and territorial integrity of the independent countries. Just to add a tiny detail, by the way, unlike many Western countries and older countries, 
Georgia never had to change its recognition from uh, the Republic of China to the People's Republic of China. We always recognized the People's Republic of China. The other countries had to make this decision, which was both, uh, well, it wasn't a very easy decision, including not just politically, but morally. Uh, <laughs> but we do not have this dilemma, frankly. Um, so we only can have some humanitarian kind of consideration. Well, before you come up with your question, I would like to ask about uh, more closer region to our neighbors. Um, what should Georgia do uh, in regard of Russia's invasion in Ukraine? There are a lot of speculations, a lot of discussions, non-irritation policy or uh, proactive uh, uh, policy with supporting Ukraine. Where is the golden line? Uh, where is the right answer to this, uh, to this question? Tengo. Uh, thank you. I think uh, today this is a, a very question, the most essential question, I, I would say. Uh, so, first of all, if we are talking about uh, mm, Russia and not irritate Russia, not annoy Russia, and so on, so on. Uh, the answer is that Mr. Putin, as well as Mr. Lavrov, they both were so outspoken and uh, firm and said that nations like Ukraine, like Georgia, they have no right to sovereignty. So <laughs> if we are talking about how to uh, please Russia uh, to them, existence of Georgia's sovereign, independent, democratic country is the irritation. So, um, therefore, the goal is clear. You have to protect your, uh, your country, your nation, your statehood, uh, sovereignty, development, uh, and prosperity. And in that regard, I mean, when it comes to how we can support Ukraine. First of all, let's uh, ask how we can support Georgia. And then, I think the answer is clear. I mean, block Russia propaganda in Georgia. This is for Ukraine or for Georgia? Or uh, make bans or restrictions or on some companies which are operating, by the way, on the occupied territories, which are financing uh, Russian military operations, be Georgia or Syria or Ukraine, but against Georgia. Or this process of borderization, uh, which is nothing but occupation and an annexation. So, make restrictions, uh, impose sanctions. Uh, that's you do that for Georgia or for Ukraine. So that's why when we are talking that our destiny is linked and we are uh, facing the same challenges, that's not just a rhetoric. Because uh, there is, ex be, let's be honest, that there is no, uh, uh, no, let's say, this war is not the operation against Ukraine. Or like 2008 was, was not operation only against Georgia. That's about Putin's vision and his policy of uh, spheres of privileged interests. So that's why you should react not case to case, but you have to react towards the policy. And today that's true, Ukraine fights for its sovereignty, but Ukraine fights for Georgia, Ukraine fights for Moldova. And by the way, Ukraine fights for the Europe, because if you don't stop Putin today in Ukraine, you will have the real Berlin Wall again in the middle of the Europe. So that's why when it comes to Georgia's contribution, it's obvious that that contribution, first of all, is contribution uh, in Georgia's uh, national resilience and Georgia's defensibility. I, I, I heard um, 
regrettably, I heard a few times that, uh, oh, we have to, we, we have no chance, we have no resilience, and so on, which I, I think it's not fair, at least towards our, 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 our uh, men and women in uniform who protected with the, this country. And uh, once again, attitude should be quite clear that we support Ukraine, we uh, contribute in the world security. Nobody talks that we should uh, jump into the war, but uh, once again, restrictions uh, towards Russian officials, Russian companies, uh, Russian propaganda, and so on, so on. First of all, this is contribution in uh, security of this nation. And last but not least, uh, I heard that if Georgia joins sanctions, it will be huge damage for Georgian economy. Excuse me, but I think that 2006 was very lesson for Georgia that you should reduce your dependence on the occupant market. In 2006, we had limited uh, capabilities, but today we have free trade with Europe. We have free trade with China. We have free trade, let's say, more than 1.5 billion markets. So my question is how much wine you produce in Georgia that that market is not enough. May I just pick up where he started? Um, <clears throat> uh, first, f well, the Rondelli Foundation uh, always um, considered itself as uh, an institution generating knowledge. Uh, we are not in opposition uh, to, and never been to any government, uh, we are not even a watchdog. But uh, there are sometimes moments when things, uh, recommendations need to be pronounced in a very, very clear way. And this is one. First of all, assessment. When the government says that it cannot afford to join the sanctions, um, well, it, first of all, it, 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 it could have been done in a different form. No one asked Prime Minister Garibashvili to make a pronouncement, an official statement, which actually sounded like he was quite proud of what he was saying, number one. So it could have been done in a different way. And I, I, I acknowledge that Georgia would have uh, some price to pay. But there is also a matter of political responsibility. And this is where I completely agree with Tengiz. Uh, who is responsible for returning Russia a trade and economic leverage over Georgia, which it had lost after 2006, after uh, unilaterally imposing embargoes and breaking up energy supplies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, after which Georgia was forced to learn how to live without a Russian energy and with diminished Russian market. This all was returned to Russia right after signing the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with the European Union. Instead of guiding Georgian businesses, uh, agriculture, other sectors of economy into the opened European market, they basically uh, encouraged uh, particularly some of the export goods, uh, starting with wine, uh, to return to the Russian market, which has proven to be volatile in good times and politically unreliable any time. Georgia had experienced this uh, uh, on its own, uh, okay? So, uh, in situations like this, when you are saying, I had no choice, you are always in that position because of your previous choices, excuse me. And this implies political responsibility. Any responsible government actually under this would consider their position, N number one. Number two, uh, yes, not just sanctions, but independence. Freedom has a price. If we go down this path 
of measuring everything by dollars and lares and cents. And the irony is that Georgia is already paying economic price for the uh, situation that is beyond our control now without joining the sanctions. And when they actually, the remainder of the sanctions, when their effects will kick in fully, do, do you believe that Russians would be able to afford fine Georgian wines as they did before? The, wouldn't Georgian export decrease and stop even without joining the sanctions? By the way, you ask Georgian winemakers whether they are able to send in uh, their produce. Number one. Actually, someone needs to talk to them and ask them if they had this option, if the government actually provided some kind of, and this government has like uh, hundreds, uh, at least dozens of uh, government-funded institutions, uh, economic and others. If there was just one who would help them find their way uh, of exporting their wine to the European markets, would not they prefer to export it to Europe, to North America, to Japan and other places, instead of Russia? Okay? The majority would tell you yes. Well, some would, of course, uh, opt to selling low-quality, cheaper wines with less fuss and with less trouble, okay? But now they are in trouble already, okay? And would there be the same level of remittances from Russia with the current economic situation where hundreds of thousands of people are losing their jobs? So aren't we already going to pay the price for the sanctions imposed by others and the ones we didn't join. I'm not saying we should act recklessly. Of course, caution should be number one priority, but it also not necessarily a uh, secure position when you are not eliminating Russian plans toward you and attitudes which were very clearly stated. If anyone could uh, not very uh, honestly, but uh, say until recently that uh, he or she wouldn't believe Russia had plans to invade, occupy neighbors, and, and top political of, uh, officials have said that. Now Putin has spelled it out for you, literally. And he's not even trying now to restore the Soviet Union. He's going farther back in time. He's speaking now about the reconstruction of Russian empire. He criticized Lenin for granting national minorities within the USSR with uh, autonomies, the republics, which Putin said were the reason why the Soviet Union broke up. Okay? He's talking about the resurrection of the Russian Empire in which Georgia did not exist. There was no gubernia even with name Georgia. So we need to realize that. So with the position like this, we are not necessarily eliminating or changing Russia's attitude and plan while we are endangering the West degree of Western support when some may actually even perceive us not just neutral but siding with Russia. And this is the final caution. Just yesterday, Jake Sullivan, the US National Security Advisor, spoke uh, on CNN warning all countries which would try to, uh, try to benefit from the uh, new sanctions regime, and especially the ones who would be trying to aid Russia in bypassing the sanctions. I'm not saying any more, okay? Just, if we are talking about the caution, well, caution this. Ah. Uh. First of all, we should maintain the stance that we have in international forums, that is a firm support of Ukraine, and this is only single justified positions that Georgia might have regarding Ukraine. Second, we should, to my understanding, activate, activate diplomatic channels with our partners, just to explain, explain the danger of Russian, Russian goals from our 
prospect and maybe find a room how use can be Georgia useful in this regard. Third, uh, we should find out ways beyond humanitarian support uh, how to help Ukraine. For example, uh, intelligence sharing might be an option. I know that we don't have uh, strong intelligence capabilities, but I hope that we are cap capable to monitor what is happening in our in, in, in the military bases which are stationed in our occupied territories and which that might provide some information about their attitude and feelings which is, which is regarding, uh, um, uh, regarding the development of the battlefield and that might be useful for, for our Ukrainian friends. And uh, last but not least, as my senior colleague already mentioned, we should avo avoid these ambiguous statements, absolutely, because this uh, raises suspicious among our partners about Georgia's foreign policy, uh, foreign policy devotion. And also government should carve down the rising activities of pro-Russian forces, pro-Russian actors, I mean, which is very evident in Georgia just to uh, ensure its own national security and uh, also in interagency working group all the threats and challenges derived from the development in, in, in Ukraine should be analyzed. This is concerning the flood of Russian citizens to Georgia because for example Russians speak themselves that the attitudes uh, towards Russian uh, Russian people has changed, for example, in Germany. And they are expecting that uh, Russians might be attacked just because they, in Germany, just because they speak among each other in Russian language. I doubt that we have a very safe situation in Georgia in this regard, and uh, presumably some preventive measures should be applied. And this concerns about our economic, uh, economic security and other, other, other fields uh, because uh, it is quite clear that the war, Russian invasion in, in Ukraine already has changed to many things, not, for, not for only, uh, only for us, but for the wider world and its outcome might have even huger impact. We are running out of time, and uh, it will be last question. And uh, please present yourself. Okay, thank you. I'm Nina Samkharadze from Georgian Institute of Politics. Um, I think my question will be brief also to answer. Um, you mentioned, like also during the previous panel, it was mentioned that Japan has its interests in the post Soviet area, especially in the Asian. Like, um, Asian region. Uh, how do you think in a scenario where Russia probably is not a complete loser in its war in Ukraine, but it is obviously isolated, severely weakened in terms of economical uh, prosperity and its influence and its soft power uh, in the post-Soviet arena, how do you think uh, what are the Japan's prospects to spill over its uh, soft power in the post-Soviet space in Asia, and can Georgia somehow navigate with Japan to somehow attract its uh, soft power again, my stressing on it, but probably there are some other possibilities as well, uh, to cooperate with Japan to attract it more in, in the region. Thank you. Very good question, Nino. Your, well, well, this is actually uh, where Georgia and, and Japanese interests could converge in, in a fundamental way. Georgia's position, its strat strategy uh, for years uh, should have been uh, devoted, and I think it wasn't, uh, this n not sufficient work has been done in this direction, and, and the, the situation that you described actually reopens opportunities. Uh, Georgia's stra strategy should have been for years, opening up for the Central Asia. 
uh, Azerbaijan and Georgia actually uh, already play a role of a bridge for the Greater Caspian region um, as a westward gateway for them. But these opportunities have not been uh, utilized for years for various reasons. Uh, but you have, someone uh, can describe this as sleeping giants, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan with its enormous gas reserves, okay? Uh, which, uh, if properly used, would not only increase their economic uh, development and prosperity, but also the level of their sovereignty. So this isn't the moment when we should return to serious consideration of building greater connectivity infrastructure, starting from Anaklia, and then involving a more uh, resilient uh, way of uh, management of Georgian, dying Georgian railways, which just the uh, fact of life was a very successful commercial company until 10 years ago, making 100 million laris profit in 2011, if I remember correctly, which is broke today. It's a bankrupt organization today, okay? And you have to manage this when you are a natural uh, monopolist. The only railway that connects region to the Black Sea ports, you have to have some skills to bankrupt such an organization, okay? But yet again, Georgia still has its huge opportunity to offer, not just Azerbaijan, but the greater Caspian region, a greater connectivity to the Black sea, wider Black Sea region. Uh, but this opportunity will not exist forever. Uh, Azerbaijan is seriously considering the alternatives, uh, particularly railway connection with Turkey. Yes, there are obstacles without permanent peace with Armenia, it's not gonna work. But if we do not become more attractive, reliable, strategic gateway for Azerbaijan first and for the Caspian, uh, sorry, Central Asian countries, uh, forget Georgia's uh, prospect of being a valuable partner to our most important allies. Okay, they will kind of still like us uh, as an aspirant democracy, but you have to represent a value, an international function, and this is the most important function that Georgia could serve. And this is where Japan could come in with its investment, with its expertise, uh, and with its interest, both in Central Asia and in the South Caucasus uh, transportation corridor. A few uh, words and uh, thank you enough for the question. Uh, fully agree with Georgi, and that's why I mentioned that Georgia is the country which provides access to the sea uh, eight from uh, 14 landlocked countries. So that's why Georgia's role is important and in that regard we agree we need development, development and development and uh, cooperation with Japan is very important. Uh, when it comes to uh, Japanese power, uh, I think the most impressive and I would say that the most important is that Japan, Japan is the shining example of transformation. Uh, this is completely different country. And when it comes to, it comes to the comparison with Russia, uh, uh, Russia altogether is 145 million. Japan is one, more than 120 million people, population. And just look at the geography, yeah? So, I mean, that, that itself, that facts tell you more uh, than any experts, uh, I mean, mm, analysts. Because this is the how country can and should and must develop. And 
when it comes to economy, when it comes to welfare, distribution of wealth, and so on. So that's why Japan has, Japan has uh, real soft power. Because Russia's, let's say, soft power, that's just a rhetoric. But in reality, Russia can't offer anything to those countries which are today suffering, uh, not only for occupation, but they are dependent on Russia market. <coughs> and you, if you really want alternative de development, and alternative development, I mean development as a market economy, as a modern and prosperous country, modern state institution, cooperation with Japan brings just benefit. Thank you. Thank you to all three of uh, all three of you uh, for this really, really excellent presentations and uh, in especially uh, the Q and A session. Uh, with this, uh, we are closing first day of our uh, symposium. I think uh, there was a lot of interesting uh, been said, and uh, I can assure you that. Tomorrow you will hear not less interesting things. So um, with this, I close the session, first uh, day session, and join me in uh, granting the then uh, expressing gratitude to our excellent speakers. Thank and you. Recording stopped. <laughs>